I'm not going to be in the parade because Ambrose wants me at the uh, dedication. Supposedly, I was supposed to be on the platform with him, but I, they didn't say anything about that. He just said, be there at a quarter of seven. In the morning? Yeah. They're going to give me breakfast, and, and then they're going to take me over in a bus to the arena. All the teeth and gums. I ran out on the beach to get one of my sergeants. And I put him on my back and I crawled with him to the wall. Wow. That's after being wounded. And he's still alive. 116. I didn't say anything last yeah. night. Yeah. I don't know. Well, how have you been? Last time I saw you was in Normandy, and you mm -hmm. said you had just recovered. Uh, incidentally, something. for your fall, for yeah. your media, yeah. this is the greatest American historian of the 20th century. I read both his books. In my opinion, in my He's humble got opinion, got more books. I read D-Day. I read Comrades, Undaunted. What, what's your Courage. latest one out now? It's coming out in August. Coming out. Nothing what's like it in the world. What's that? The building of the Transcontinental Railroad. Oh. Omaha to Sacramento. All right, I'm going to have to run. That's fine. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you for stopping by. Thank you, Sam. I reminded him. Didn't he come out with something recently in paperback? I reminded him in front of the media that he wanted me on the platform. <laughs> he forgot about that. I got the letter with me that says, I want you on the platform. They, they wrote us. They sent I'll us let it drop. Kind of well, it was nice of him to stop yeah. by. He could have just yeah. ignored us. And, uh, well, I told him that... Uh, he is today. Wow. wow. Congratulations. Congratulations. Did you know that? Yes. Hal told me. So one of the things that motivated me to do this is that there hasn't been anything done on uh, with all the concentration on the Holocaust, the American experience, and the Jewish American experience, and the contribution to the, the Allied effort, which was, I think, tremendous. Um, it, where are you from originally? Originally from New York City. My father came over to uh, New York from Vienna when he was a teenager. And uh, very patriotic towards this country because he, uh, he started out with nothing and formed his own building business and roofing and contracting. And uh, always brought me up to... Uh, Love the United States. So you were patriotic? Patriotic. To the point where if a flag goes by or they play the Star Spangled Banner, tears come down my, from my eyes. <coughs> Was there much of a Jewish identity in the family? Um, yeah, of course. You mean religion? Yeah. Sure. Of course. So uh, how, about, how about you, Al? Was it. Uh, were you part of a religious household? Or? I grew, grew up in a very religious ho household and went to an Orthodox synagogue in Carbondale when I was growing up. And didn't lose it until I was in the Army for a while. Was it, was it hard, the, the transition from, uh, was it hard to be a Jewish GI? It was hard because I got tired eating peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. So, you know. I, did, I didn't come from a kosher house, but and my mother's family was completely orthodox. They still are. They're in Easton, Pennsylvania. E A S T O N. So, having a Jewish background and, and growing up, you know, reading newspapers, and especially in the 30s, did you have an idea that uh, the Germans were anti-Semitic? Oh, sure, certainly. Did that at all influence your your wanting to participate in it? Right to the point where I, I think I mentioned to you before. I went into combat, I drew a large Star of David on the back of my field jacket with the Bronx above it and New York below it. 
And uh, so you can imagine if I got captured, what would have happened? And I had my mezizah sticking out of my uniform shirt purposely on my, with my dog tags. Dog tags had a big H on it. And he still wears his still mezizah, mezizah every mezizah. day. Same one? No. No, it's not the same one. I don't know what happened to the other. Still got the dog tags, though. Were you in the same uh, regiment? No. No, he was in the 115th. Hal was in the 116th. First in. First in. Yeah. Is there any way to describe it? We had just come from an interview where he was asking uh, detailed questions. In the, is there any way to describe what was going through your mind in the hours before the actual invasion? Well, uh, you know, what was rough, we left the mothership about 3 in the morning. We're going through a very rough English channel where the waves are coming over the, the little ship. Uh, despite what Stephen Ambrose has been saying about the Higgins boat, we landed in LCAs, the first wave, uh, from the 116th, especially the 1st Battalion, and the Rangers landed in LCAs, which was the British version of the Higgins boat. And they were built lower in the water because they had armor plate on the side so that the water kept coming into the ship and we were bailing out with our helmets. So our legs were freezing. We were standing there with our 100 pound plus equipment. You know, the, the LCA is a little smaller than the American Higgins boat. So you couldn't turn to the side. You're standing in one place with all that weight. You, you, water was up to almost your knees and uh, vomitus was in the boat from the fellows being seasick and uh, uh, explosives floating around the boat, and we were bailing out with our helmets. So that's part of what was going on, going in. Fortunately, I didn't get nauseated, so I was lucky. And we saw all these planes going over us. The sky was black with planes, and we, we yelled up to them, give them hell because we don't think we're going to make it because the ship was going down. But three of the boats of the, uh, of the first two, two companies um, turned over, and two of the boatloads were, fellows were drowned. One boatload from Company A, um, they stayed in the water for over an hour and got picked up by the same mothership that took us in. They were from the 1st Battalion of the 116th, and they didn't get back to combat until the 9th. In, in the interview uh, at the... Uh Eisenhower Center, you'd mentioned that you'd seen what was happening to the 116th. How, how, how would you describe that? What did you see from, from your vantage point? Well, we were rather, uh, I think the right word was horrified to see what was happening. And uh, looking at it thinking we were going to follow them in, and that wasn't pleasant to think about. When the word came down that we wouldn't follow them in, we go up the coast a away and get in there, we felt better. The other it was a real inferno that they were involved. The other thing that was interesting, when I went to New York University, we had what was called the Hall of Fame of Great Americans. It was called the Colonnade. They don't have that campus anymore in New York. It was called the University Heights campus. And I used to like to study near those busts in that, those statues of great Americans. But off to the side, they had a special area which had the statue of Lafayette. And, uh, you know, I knew the man sacrificed his, uh, his own life and his money to help the United States. So going through my mind as we were getting ready to land is Lafayette, we are here. I put this in my new book that I just wrote. What book did you write? Uh, Eyewitness on Omaha Beach. Now, how, how long were you in the water? Uh, um, when we landed, oh, uh, well, first of all, the boat next to us blew up. The shell landed in it, so we, we were showered with wood, metal, and uh, body parts. Then our ramp went down, and that was a signal for all the machine guns on that beach. There were three on the bluff in front of us to, to zero in on the doors of the, of the boats coming in. The pillbox on the right was disguised. And when you go there nowadays, it looks like a pillbox. It's still there.
but it was disguised as a seaside cottage, but it was a pillbox, and that was causing his trouble. So the, all the machine guns zeroed in on the guys. When they opened, the ramp went down. As the fellas took their first step, they were mowed down. I was the fifth man on the left. I just got creased in the helmet. And if they had hit me in the right side of the helmet, I had a blasting cap and fuse, and fuse lighter in the, the netting. It was a stupid place to have it. But anyway, I jumped into the water, and I, the fellow in front of me was killed right away. His name was Clarius Riggs, Tennessee, um, BAR man. Uh, when I jumped into the water, it was neck deep, and I was I'm five nine or so, and uh, the average American soldier in those days was about five foot seven. So a lot of them just drowned because well, they made us wear our life preservers. Now you don't see this in the museum. The museum shows the life preserver around the waist. We wore ours under the arms and over this little black gas mask supposed to hold our chin up, but these fellows just went down like rocks. They didn't have a chance. So uh, I, I, I ran through the water. We had two DD tanks on my beach, which Spielberg didn't show in his movie. They were the dual drive tanks that came in looking like boats. When they got in, they pulled the brake on the top, and the rubber Firestone sides went down and the Germans were faced with this 76 millimeter ship gun. Uh, one of them was already knocked out, the one on this side. The one closest to me, I was coming in here on the right flank of Dog Green Beach, all the, the western part of Dog Green Beach. This tank was still firing. Now, behind those tanks were some Company A men hanging on to it. So there were about, I'd say, 13 men, six, six or seven on each tank. I had to make up my decision. And here's where my Judaism came in. Uh, I was in with mostly Gentile fellows, mostly Southerners. And I had to make my decision. Should I go hide behind a tank or should I keep going forward? And I figured if I hide behind a tank, uh, they'll say that Jew is yellow. And I didn't want them to think that. So I just went straight. And when I got to the sand, I, I was telling this fellow over here, um, while we, when we hit the sand, we were going like this direction. There was a fellow named Robert Dittmar here. I was here. The fellow was behind me. We were running at port arms, rifle across your chest. And I heard machine gun fire came right across us. I heard thud from here. He got hit in the chest. My rifle vibrated. I turned it around. It was a clean hole in the magazine section. So my seven bullets saved me from getting shot in the chest. And I heard a thud from this side simultaneously, and he was gone. So I hit the, I hit the sand behind one of these hedgehogs, you know, one of these things, steel rails. And, uh, which didn't, didn't afford much safety, you know. But this fellow in front of me was, was laying sprawled on the sand, and he was screaming, Mom, Mother, and then he was silent. And incidentally, I met his mother after the war. She gave us a wedding present, Robert Dittmar's mother. And the, uh, the other thing that was uh, interesting was uh, one of my sergeants on the left side of me was uh, helmetless, uh, just uh, going through the water and um, out of it, really, and a big hole in the left side of his head. And he passed by, he had his blood in his blonde hair, passed by me, got a little behind me, knelt down, took out his rosary beads and started praying, facing the wall. And I was yelling, get down. A machine gun in the pillbox on the right just cut him in half. I mean, really cut him in half. So that was my that was my first adventure on the beach. Was that a concern? You'd mentioned that you didn't want to be seen as yellow. Was that a, was that a concern? One of the things I once saw a movie. Uh, well, 
Well, yeah. there, there was a there was a concern that, <coughs> that Jewish my, boy didn't want to. But my concern was this: a lot of people, even when I got back in the hospital in the states, somebody said to me, "Oh, you were in the infantry? I thought all you Jewish guys had desk jobs." So that was the the attitude. There was a lot of prejudice in the service. So Not in combat. Everybody was your buddy in combat. Did you encounter any similar prejudice? I had to walk guard duty on Passover in, uh, in England, but my first lieutenant from Company A said he didn't know I was Jewish. So I went to services, though. Was there the same kind of chaos on the beach that you landed? Yeah. There was a minefield right in front of us, and we had to walk through that very, very carefully. Did everyone land where they were supposed to land, or was it? Well, we were sent up and around them. This was not the beach we were supposed to go into because uh, we were supposed to follow them up to the Vierville draw. And where we finally ended up was just below where the American cemetery is now. And that's about a mile up the beach. Yeah, it's Colville. So what was your next adventure? Oh, uh, well, um, I, I, uh, I figured I'd better do something, so I I, uh, I saw this reflection on a helmet to the, to the right on the bluff, and I zeroed in on him, and uh, all of a sudden the machine gun from that side wasn't firing anymore. So I, I guess I knocked him out. But then the, the rifle didn't eject. See, the magazine is where your bullets are. There was one in the chamber, so it fired. Uh, when it didn't eject, I kneeled up and I took my right foot and I put it on the bolt and then the rifle cracked in half. So I threw both pieces away. The water was coming in uh, uh, like an inch a minute. So it, when I landed on the sand it was dry, but damp. But at that time it was already getting to be two or three inches deep. So I threw the two pieces away and one of my Company A buddies crawled up to me. It was like his last breath and he handed me back the two pieces of rifle. And I never realized until the present day why he did that. Until I wrote my book five years, six years ago, I never realized why. His name was Nicholas Kafkaus. Uh, everything was so one-sided. He wanted, his attitude was, he wanted to show me that I should keep fighting. He thought I was giving up because I threw the piece of rifle away. Did you keep playing? Oh, yeah. After that, I, uh, yeah, uh, I was praying on the beach, but when I, I looked up at that pillbox on the right and I started cursing, and I never curse. I won't tell you what I said, but I looked up to the right, and just then an 88 millimeter shell went off in front of me and um, hit one of my company A buddies right in the face. His name was Bedford Hoback. His sister just unveiled that um, figure up there in Bedford uh, for the, their uh, memorial service up there. She lost two brothers. That was one of her brothers, and I got hit right in the left side of the face. Now, if I had been down a little lower, I would have lost my eye, my head. It just, uh, somebody's watching over me. But I lost my whole upper jaw on that side. This was shot open. The roof of my mouth had a hole tongue was cut, it was teeth and gums laying on my tongue for the rest of the time, till I got back to England, June 11. How long did you stay on the beach wounded? Uh, once I got wounded, I, I, I took that dirty water and I washed my face out in the water. It was ice cold, and uh, I didn't pass out, but the, I saw the blood in the water. I mean, it was really gushing out. In those days, they didn't know anything about aspirins, keeping your blood thin. And I had two APCs at 9 o'clock the night before from one of the Company A aid men. I didn't know anybody in Company B. I got transferred, uh, except a couple guys in my boat uh, and the lieutenant, because I got transferred on May 23rd to Company B. So after I got shot in the face, I started to crawl as fast as I could in towards the bee. I got rid of all my equipment. I had trouble getting the life preserver off. 
because I squeeze the, in trying to unhook it, I squeeze the uh, carbon dioxide capsules and put my arms up like that. But anyway, I got the equipment off, I started to go in, and where the water was coming in behind me, I made like a dead man's float. But I, any minute I expected the machine gun from the right to uh, finish me off. Because they were pretty good, they had snipers up there too. The beach was mined, they had teller mines. They had mines on all those hedgehogs and everything was mined. But anyway, when I got to the wall, there was a fellow there from Company A named Dominic Soro, S-U-R-R-O, who was un, un, not unscathed, not, not a wound on him. And he was one of the guys that I had trained with. He was a big Georgia boy. I was big at the time. I weighed 200 pounds, D-Day. And this fellow was bigger than me. And he pushed me down against, the wall came up at a 90 degree angle. And then it went up like that about 30 feet high at that part of the beach. He pushed me down, he says, you, you stay here in his southern accent. I'm going down and get, get some help. I couldn't stay there because that machine gun was, was still firing at me. So I picked up a rifle from one of my buddies there and I followed him down the wall. And all of a sudden, I, we were going towards Fearville, which was about maybe six or seven hundred yards to our we had a few more days of school before school was out for the summertime. And I went to school, and there was an announcement on the loudspeaker that all the students were to report to the auditorium. So my friends and all went to the auditorium. We wondered what is going on when the principal announced that the Allied forces had landed on Normandy and that we should all go home to our synagogues, temples, churches, whatever, and pray for our boys. And so my best friend and I immediately went home and stopped off at our local synagogue, and we went inside and we said prayers. We didn't know who we were praying for, but just our American boys that were over there. And who knew that four years later, I would find the boy that I was apparently praying for and married him. Right. So you were still making your way along the wall? Okay, I heard I heard clunk, and they shot him through the head, one of the snipers, so he was gone. What happened? He, so, he got shot in the helmet by a sniper. Now, why not me? I was right behind him. Anyway, um, as I was running along that wall, there were hands reaching up, you know, guys that were dying. And I tried to pull them up, but, you know, it, so only so much you can do. When I got to the wall, my best buddy was laying there face down from uh, Company B. He had his, he had his uh, 25 foot of prime accord on his back. He still had his right, he was only five foot seven, how he got through that water. Anyway, uh, he had all his equipment on him, his hand grenades, his ammunition, his rifle was laying there. He had his walkie-talkie radio around his shoulder. And the guys helped me up on the wall. There was four fellows on the wall there. That was out of the whole bunch that landed, the door green. That was it, right where the National Guard monument is now. Mm -hmm. And that wall was about 15 foot high or more. You know how high it is now. And it was loose stones, it was loose shale stones. If you go there now, it's cemented over. Um, the guys helped me up on the wall. On my right was a fellow named Hal Weber, who was a Jewish boy from Springfield, Massachusetts. He was the company scout of Company A. And we went on uh, past together in England. Sent his picture, my picture home to his family. Uh, he had his face shot off, he was dying. Up in front of me was a fellow named Gilbert Pittenger, and he was already wounded. On my left was a Jewish boy named Freddie Kaufman, and he was wounded. And up in front of him was a fellow named Donald Zimzak. I, don't ask me to spell it. But anyway, we took shelter behind that wall. That wall probably saved, saved something. Now, had the Germans come down the, from their fortified places, 
They could have swept this off the whole beach and the invasion would have been over. All they needed was a company of men. Uh, somebody made that statement, some officer, that for the, for the lack of coming down that beach, they could have wiped us out. But anyway, uh, later on, the interesting things that happened to me at 8 o'clock in the morning, a Company A8 man came along and bandaged my face. He was the greatest hero of D-Day. His name was Cecil Breeden. He was from Deer, Deer Trail, Colorado. And he, we communicated with each other until he died in 1991 of eruption aneurysm. He bandaged me up and uh, what else happened? 10 o'clock was an interesting thing. I looked out on the beach and uh, I saw this sergeant that I knew from Company A named John Frazier. And uh, I could see his eyelids moving, but he wasn't moving off the beach and the mortar shells were coming in on the beach. So I, I ran out to get him. And uh, I kneeled over him and my, this side of my face was facing the wall and three pieces of mortar shell hit me in this helmet. Came out with blood, blood was running down my neck and I thought he was trying to tell me something. He would have gotten it in the face. So I grabbed, I grabbed this hand with this arm and I put him over my shoulder and I crawled with him to the wall with him on my back. So I was pretty strong at the time to be able to do that because he's, I got a picture of him recent days with him. He's still alive and uh, he's about six foot two or three and he weighs even now he weighs about 230 pounds. So I got him to the safety of the wall, and I hadn't seen him again until, like, when did I meet him up in Bedford? I uh, met him in Bedford at a bre Company A breakfast about, oh, four years ago. So when you were up on the bluff, were there any German prisoners taken? <coughs> oh, that was later on. Yeah. Uh, later on, we didn't. The guys, I, I, I didn't go up on the bluff. In fact, uh, that morning I did say my Jewish prayer. I, I said Shamar, my Shamar prayer, because I figured I was dying. Now, one of the aid men there from the 104th Medical looked at my face, saw all the blood on me, and he said, uh, why don't you run down the beach to St. Laurent Samaire and get evacuated? Um, I didn't know. I was pre-med at the time, I had two years of pre-med. I didn't think they could put somebody back together that had all those gums and teeth and, and I could stick my tongue up into my, you know, into my, way up into my nose. And I figured I was a dead duck anyway. So about one o'clock, I, with 11 other guys who some of them were severely wounded, we went up the bluff and we turned to the right and we went up to the western part of Vierville. There were two, two huge pillboxes in Vierville. They're still there in the center of town. But uh, we, we had a few firefights, and uh, we, by the time we ended up at 5 o'clock in the... And you asked about prisoners. We didn't take any prisoners. And the reason for that is I, I would say that I was crying mad. And whereas I told one of my officers, in, in England, I said, I don't think I'm going to be able to kill anybody. He said, Baumgarten, I, you, I guarantee you that you will, you'll do your duty at the time. And I, uh, I didn't have any qualms about killing anybody. We didn't take any, no, no prisoners. One of the guys fighting with me was shot through the neck. Another guy, when we went up the hill, had a tunicate around this arm, had his 29th Division uh, patch, was hanging loose from, you know, shell fire, and blood was dripping down his hand. He had his rifle in, in this hand. One of the guys might have been a ranger because he had a submachine gun with him. I never qualified with a submachine gun. I ended up with a submachine gun. That was the last weapon I fired on D-Day, or the next day. So how, how many did you 
fight for an extra day, T-Day plus one? Yeah, well, I'll give, you, I'll give you a short summary. Five o'clock, I tripped a castrate of mine, which shot a bullet through my left foot like this, came out here, made a hole through my legging, took out all these bones, split the big toe in half. Uh, I tried to bandage it, but uh, uh, shells started coming in, so I just dove behind a hedgerow. And uh, by that time, there were seven of us left, six and myself. Twelve, about 12.30 in the morning, that was rule number three, 12.30 in the morning, we crossed the road. I don't know who came up with that bright idea, but German machine gun was zeroed in on that road. So I limped a little behind them because I was walking with no metatarsis. And uh, they all got killed. I got shot through here, took this part of the jaw. So I landed on six bodies, and they were moaning, you know, help me, Jesus. And, uh, Finally, it was silent, and I was all alone. So I, but I had two weapons, submachine gun from the guy below me and my rifle. So I was going to go out in a blaze of glory. You know, I figured the Germans are going to come and finish me off, but they never came down the road. Now, you might wonder why I was in no pain in all that time. We were shooting, a, I was shooting a little morphine under my skin and my hand with the serrets they gave us. Did they give you morphine in when your I was first wounded, aid yeah. kit? Yeah. No, I mean, did you carry your own? Yeah. yeah. So we had our own morphine, and um, about, that was about 12.30, so that was June 7th. So that was rule number, number four. And uh, about three o'clock in the morning, um, I saw an ambulance coming down the road. That was the road going to Grand Camp. And uh, we were in the ditch. And uh, it was silhouetted against this huge moon. D-Day was a huge moon, remember yeah. that? Mm -hmm. And uh, I figured, how am I going to get him to stop? I was turning blue. Um, I was weak. And the only, the only thing I could think of, I couldn't yell, couldn't talk. Joe, this, this was all gone. So I picked up this submachine gun, which I never fired, and I fired over the roof of the ambulance. And these two fellas got out and uh, with their hands up, but they saw it was one of theirs, so they, they, uh, they said something uh, funny to me. They helped me up. I put an arm around each of their shoulders, and they said, can you sit up in the ambulance? Now, me as a doctor now, I can't picture it. Asking, as they picked me up, all this blood rolled down my, from my uniform. Uh, not all my own blood, it's part of the other guys. But they put me back in the back of the ambulance, which was a cold metal floor, and I, I tried to sit up, but I was too weak, and I fell back, and I could tell that this fellow was probably from New York. It was the 104th Medical. And uh, he said, this guy just passed out, you know, New York accent like my accent. So uh, they took me down the beach to St. Laurent Sumer, put me in a stretcher, and they laid me out on the sand. And uh, about 10 o'clock in the morning, the sniper opened up on all of us. Uh, the eight men, they were giving us water and morphine. They were tagging us, giving us morphine. They, uh, they put a, a bullet through the Red Cross on his armband. When they got to me, they shot me in the right knee. And the next one would have gone right through here. But I guess uh, God was with me because a Navy destroyer came right off the beach and blew the sniper away. The, you could hear the shell coming over you. And then all of a sudden, the, the whole bluff went up in, in smoke and uh, no more sniper. At 3 o'clock in the afternoon, four Navy guys came up, picked up my stretcher, and took me out to an assault boat, and they took me out to LST-291 and uh, raised me up with ropes uh, up to the top deck. I laid on the top deck, and I looked up, and there was old glory up there, huge flag. And 
Keep in mind, all this time, I thought we lost the whole battle. Because at 12 midnight, five planes flew over me, about 12.30, 1 o'clock. Uh, well, actually, it was three German planes. Uh, with You could see the swastika on them. You could tell a German plane because their engine sounded different than an American. Their engines went off and on. They went, uh, uh. Now, you didn't hear a steady buzz. So I figured, in fact, they were that low that I covered over the luminous dial on my watch. That's how I knew all these times. I was wearing a Swiss watch with a luminous dial. Waterproof, automatic. So I covered the dial, which was stupid, but I figured they're that low. Uh, anyway, I thought we lost the war. So uh, when I saw that flag, it, it was very impressive to me. And then the uh, Navy doctor got a hold of me, cut my clothes off, gave me blood, uh, they gave me glucose, um, and uh, sewed my knee up. They left everything else open, but the knee was pumping. So, so that's the whole story in a nutshell. Are these stories that the wives hear often? Do you hear these stories often? or? I know, but, I, but those, she those are similar stories. She has, because okay. I, when she first, read my book. When he first proposed to me, oh. he started to cry. And he said, before you say yes or no, I have to tell you something about myself. And then he told me a little bit, and he said, this is an artificial gum. These are artificial teeth. And he was in his 20s. He was an old man at the age of 23, 24. Yeah, all this is plastic. He said, he, he, he just I, looked old. He yeah. wasn't well, he was. <laughs> all this is plastic. Where other boys yeah. would be fun and games. He was very yeah. serious minded. He came back a complete very serious person and uh, didn't see a lot of humor in life and, and he thought that would make me say no I won't marry you but of course I did marry him and we had a wonderful marriage and uh, he never talked about it again except he had nightmares at night he'd always say why was I spared uh, until 1988 we were invited to go to a dedication in France at Virville Samer for a 29th monument. And, and he Al said, was there. Uh, that's right, I met the yeah, Angela was there. there. And he yeah, said, Why we, should uh, I go? Yeah, yeah. Everybody I know, everybody in my outfit is dead. There isn't anybody. But we decided to go because he wanted to show me the area. And when we went, we discovered this wonderful group of 29ers yeah, the, that were alive. Right, at the airport. I right away met uh, John Slaughter, who I remembered from Ivy Bridge, England. You can't miss him, he's six foot six almost. So I remembered him, and, and uh, when I got on the plane, just out of curiosity, <coughs> I went back uh, to John Slaughter and I said, by the way, is there a fellow named Cecil Breeden on the plane? He said, matter of fact, there is. You can't miss him, he's on the other side of the plane, and he's wearing a cowboy hat. So I went over there, and I tapped this man on the shoulder, and that same face looked, uh, looked up at me that leaned over me on the beach. I don't know if I didn't tell you that story. He leaned over me on the beach with the shells landing all around us, and I, I tried to grab him by his shirt to pull him down, and he slapped my hand away, and he said, you're hurt now when I get hurt. Take care of me. So he gave me a big hug, and he woke Rita up and, and told her the whole story. He said he my cheek was laying over my ear when he came up to me. And he said truthfully he thought that he was dead. And truthfully, I thought he was dead, because how he, could he survive? He thought that Cecil Breeden was dead. So for the first time to see each other in 1988, since 1944, that was quite a shocker on that plane. So I got the... He got a thrill meeting me because he felt like he had done, saved somebody. And I got the same thrill when I met John Fraser for the first time. I had talked to him on the phone. Cecil gave me this John Fraser's, the one I dragged off the beach. He got me his phone number and uh, address. So I wrote to him and he called me at my insurance company I was working at. And the uh, first time I met him was in Bedford, 
Virginia at a Company A reunion. And I got that same feeling when he grabbed my hand and he said, I owe you a lot. Just tell me he became a doctor. Oh, he knows it, yeah. He became a millionaire, this film. Did you notice when he was talking, he said, this one was Jewish, this one was right. Jewish? There's no conception in the American public's mind of how many Jews yeah. were involved right. on the Normandy right. beaches those days. So he's talking about one company, right. and this was throughout right. all the companies. There. Our, our mail clerk was Jewish. His name was uh, Friedman. And we had another fellow in Company A named Erwin Bogart, who just died in January. He was a bazooka man in uh, Company A. To tell us something else, and that's a little ironic, is that we have a daughter who is married and lives in New Orleans and is married to a boy whose parents were Holocaust victims who both survived the Holocaust. And I just think it's weird that, that my husband was involved in fighting this war and these people were saved from concentration camps and that their son met my daughter, and they have a happy marriage, too. Their 25th wedding anniversary is uh, the 7th. You mentioned praying, and did, did you, were you any more religious <coughs> the experience? No, I was, well, uh, no, I would call myself religious enough, because I went to Friday night services, and the, in the service, we used a little, a little, uh, Sitter that they gave us for, for walk right. It was a more of a reformed uh, type of service. In fact, Company B, I didn't realize my Company B uh, uh, clerk, the uh, company clerk, was Jewish. And uh, he gave me a pass to leave this secret camp. And usually nobody was allowed out of those camps to go to services in Dorchester, England. And uh, I didn't know he was Jewish at the time, but I found out after the war because I met his wife down in Miami Beach when I was on pass, and she said, oh, he's missing in action. And while I was down in Miami Beach on furlough, she received his, uh, re his personal effects, and uh, that's why I found out he was Jewish. And uh, I followed up on that story. A fellow named Bob Sales, who was in Company B, who landed in the first wave, uh, told me, oh, he said, he was, uh, he was in Nicene, and I saw him get blown up. And he was in a place where he shouldn't have been. He was up in front with us, taking a, uh, a list of all the uh, rifles we needed or mess kits, and he didn't belong there. He belonged back in, behind the lines. And he got blown up right next to me. So that was the, that's how I had put the stories together in later years. It's hard to tell who was and who wasn't. I, I was in Normandy last September with General Blum. He took over 50 of his young 29ers and he wanted a couple of veterans and I was one of them. And we were there the first day of Rosh Hashanah while well, I was wondering what to do. And this captain came up to me and looked at his name tag, Captain Wang, W-A-N-G. And he said to me, uh, sir, would you like to come with me and General Blum's son, who's also Jewish, we're going down to find one of the Jewish graves, six-pointed star, and we want to say Kaddish, you want to come with me? I said, you're Jewish? <laughs> Why? He said, yes, I am. So you just, you just never know. <clears throat> so they're coming right on. He's going to take over the 29 or something. Um, Al Ungeleiter is responsible for a couple of interesting things for a 29th Division Association. He was national commander. I'm now the national surgeon, which is like nothing, but he, he was important. He, he made sure that they didn't, uh, they didn't end their prayers with, uh, in the name of the Father and the Holy Ghost and all that. And we said Kaddish at one of our memorial services with the 29th That's Division. when I was leading the service. Right, when he was Kaddish, leading the service. And we said the right. Mole Rachamim. Right. And, uh, you know. and I think the other fellows respected us for it. Are either of you involved in Jewish war veterans? Uh, I'm, a, I'm, a life, I'm a life member, but I'm not active in it.
I joined it to give them my support. I'm just, I'm, as I said before, just interested in, in exactly what you just said, that a lot of people just don't know that, especially in the eye of the attack, in, in the eye of the invasion, that there were Jewish boys who were, right. who were making a contribution. And you have a fellow named uh, Mimmelstein from... Uh, from um, I, I Dallas. Mean, I've been checking to see if yeah. he's here because he's, he's listed be on the list right. as the Fairmont Hotel, but either he didn't come at all or he may be coming just right. for D-Day or whatever, but uh, he's not in the hotel at this time. And Mimmelstein has a silver star. I think he got that for carrying a man off the, out of uh, danger. What decorations do the two of you have? I guess I got a bronze star for Valor. I've got three of them, all in Norman. Depends who was writing up to the awards, whether yeah. you got a silver star or a bronze star for that one. Those are pretty equal at the time. Yeah, I got the Purple Heart, two bronze stars. And, uh, of course, <coughs> we, got, we, we both got French medals. I'm sure we all got them. Well, I think, uh, I think we're about done. Yeah. I think it's it. Yes. I tell you, it's like a motion picture in my brain. Yeah, I'm, I'm cursed with a good memory. That's... <coughs> that was I great. Think all of you. Now, Al did not remember our first date, but did you hear him this afternoon talk for an hour and a half about his life? <laughs> Tell me about the first date. <laughs> <laughs> you have to Tell me the room number yeah. we stayed in. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Chaim. 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 Oh, you asked about prisoners. The only guy that's alive from my boat team, Charles Connor, he hid behind the tank that day. Uh, he came He came out of the boat after me. Probably by the time Company B reached the wall, almost everybody was gone. The Bob, this Bob Sales I mentioned, he was the radio man with the captain. The captain, uh, Zabacosta, Company B, got killed in the water. Every man in his boat team got killed. Captain Taylor N. Fellers of Company A, commanding officer, was killed in the water. So it was it was complete wipeout on Dog Green. We had no officers. We lost all the officers in the first five minutes. Now the the big officer hero on our beach that I saw was uh, General Norman Dakota. He came running down the beach with the snipers shooting at him. He had a pistol in one hand, and he had a uh, he had, I believe, a major or a lieutenant colonel with him. I think it was a major. And uh, they were running down the beach together. And he was making sure that everybody was moving. And yeah, he said, get off the beach. You might as yeah. well get killed yeah. doing that to sit and land here and get killed. And, and he was a he's got super, him superhero. Well, I was a Jewish kid yeah. who painted you yeah. put a Jewish star <laughs> yeah. on the back of his jacket. They with all asked the me target. that. <laughs> you painted a... Paint a Star of David right. on the back yeah, of your Yeah, I took right, my Evershaw pen and I painted a big, big Star of David on the, uh, on the, the field jacket. jacket. So I had my pack off. So any German saw my Star of David. And it said the Bronx on top, New York. Where are the Bronx are you from? Uh, I was from the West Bronx near NYU, where NYU used to be. I live in Queens right now. But this is, I guess, my age at the time. And uh, I guess, you know, the, the guys in my outfit say, you know, you're crazy. You're going to have, the, I won't tell you what they told me is going to happen to me. But uh, they, I think they respected me for it. But everybody in combat is your buddy. They don't want, they don't want anything to happen to you. Like the Cecil Breeden took care of me. Uh, uh, probably any 29er would lay down his life for another 29er in combat. Have you run into anyone uh, this weekend so far? Well, we uh, met some fellas from uh, from our town here. Uh, I have lunch with 29ers uh, once a month. In Florida? Yeah, and we let one 9th Division man in with us. His name is Joe Williams. He wrote a book on his adventures in the Army where he was in charge of Spandau Prison where the Nazi prisoners were. And his job was to, to hang them. <laughs> and he hung at least nine a day, he told me. And this went on for months or years. He wrote a book on it. 
I read his book, but I don't have a copy of it. As the years progressed and as the war you know, became more of a distant memory, did, did you harbor any kind of an animosity towards Germans, or was it especially after you heard about the Holocaust? Animosity against Nazis. We, we both went to the Com Cemetery, the German cemetery. I signed the book, and I walked around looking at the stones in recent, you know, when we were there last year. And I, I see uh, kids 17. I, I doubt if they, I doubt if they had any uh, killings of Jews. It's hard to say because um, we, we were fighting against the 352nd uh, uh, German division. And they were, uh, so there were a lot of Nazis in there. I, my wife drives a German car. She's got a Mercedes. That's because we visited Israel. Yeah. And in Israel, they all drive German cars. And we cars. asked them why. And then when I came back home, I said, you know, if the people from Israel can drive German cars, and they say they're the best, I hate to admit it. That's why we, uh, we asked them why. And they said, because they're the best damn cars. I drive a Japanese car. So, you know, you're saying about harboring, uh, there's some people that will not uh, uh, do any business in the New Germans. Now, the people in St. Lo, for example, that are so nice to us whenever we go there, they told us this last year, that they said, you know, after you leave, we're going to have the Germans in here. So, and they had German flags flying. Remember that? Yeah. The Germans lived with them longer yeah. than we did. Right. That's for sure. Right. Did, uh, did you, either of you drive a German car? No. No, no we got a Swedish Volvo. Mm -hmm. and, uh, <laughs> so what's, uh, what kind of plans does uh, everyone have tomorrow? Anything exciting planned for the veterans? Well, are these interviews by uh, Stephen Ambrose and that crew going to be here at this hotel? No, it's at the hill. Because you're like worse, isn't it? Yeah. She came My grandpa lives in the mountains. And we all I, sat at the table, and it was so... They're going to be there again in October. In, uh, I was just there. Yeah. Uh, we're not sure if we're going, because it's right between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, and we have to fly a boat. We're not well, sure. Incidentally, my book is well, in the museum in the town I really of want him to go, because I feel... What's the title of it again? I will be found no more. Do you have plans to go back? Oh, yeah, I can go back. I don't we could have our own we service have for the whole time. It isn't we're actually, it's just between. I would between. my synagogue. See, I love oh, my yeah. synagogue. So, but actually, school, what, so, come, what is uh, the window uh, there of uh, time to go? Like to go with well, I, I don't have my uh, calendar with me, so, but, uh, like, we would have Monday to Friday, probably. Mm -hmm. to get up there and rent a car, drive up there. But if I was going, I'd like to spend a few days like in Baltimore or, you know, just not go straight to the meeting and straight back. So I had to send we'll see. You know where everything goes. This is Al. Al, how old were you in this picture? Uh, 21. 21 years old. We're planning on going back for Veterans Day, not seeing infection and just... Oh, this is a good picture. I was always wondering if you December 3rd on D-Day. Is there, is there any figure out there? I think the group of all that's my daughter. Okay. Could you eat more? Is that interesting? Personally, thank you. Yeah, for us, it's real. It's important that we're here for 2,000 years. Because we're dying because we're fighting. But the Jewish people, how the Jewish people survive that culture. Look at this. This is the year I presented the wreath, and look at the turnout we have for the army at that time. This is the last two years ago that we sold it. Forget about that. It's important. It's like him. It's got a Jewish identity. Where is this, Al? That's at Columbia in Normandy. Uh, can you repeat that for me? This picture was taken at the Princess Royale Hotel in Ocean City, Maryland, and Ruth and I were celebrating my 
elevation to national commander of the 29th Division this, uh, Association. I don't know if you read this book by uh, Thomas Tompkins, who was a strong writer about this event here, Masters, that we had to be using it all. I don't care if you can just felt that the museum should fly him down, put him on the panels, and be very proud. Chance. American Military Jewish, Cemetery. In Normandy? In Normandy. Uh, on my right is a fellow by the name of Marshall Churn, who was a lawyer in Florida. And the other was Russell Murphy, my radio operator during World War II, who since died. Too much glare off it. Enough? No, hold on. This can't get the glare off this picture. Well, put it over here. Yeah, that, that was okay. a, you know, Well, <laughs> these are some more pictures. My grandmother, this is the grandmother. Yeah, just the picture of my grandmother. I'll check with the judge at that time, gets that privilege for the 29th. Yeah, I'm going to. Yeah, sure. I'm going to ask you to say that one. Oh, no, this is good. Yes, you do. This picture is a annual uh, memorial service that we have at Arlington National Cemetery at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. The 29th Division Association presents a wreath yeah. and the national commander at the time gets the privilege of presenting that wreath and I was national commander at that time. The troops are troops from the 3rd Infantry to guard the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. Isn't that great? This is the Tenth Corps. General Abrams presenting the trade mm -hmm. something. Yeah. Meyer. No, no. This yeah. is uh, my radio operator, Oscar Garcia. I think that's. We're just going to shoot a couple. Yeah, yeah we're going to find the ladies' room. Let me just yeah, we're going to call uh, this gentleman. He said any time after four, he'll be ready. Okay, would you, if you'd like to use my phone, you're more than welcome to. Uh, she has a phone. Number. <laughs> now, what? What? Uh, you're leaving on Wednesday, right? We're leaving Wednesday. Uh, Thursday, I hope to get down to the. Uh, Wednesday. When, uh, Tuesday. Oh. On D-Day, and then from there we go. Where will we get November seventh. Forty-four. Al, who's the gentleman you mentioned that you said was? Whether he's coming at all, or just coming for the funk, big stuff on the sixth. The, D-Day, I don't know. Great Abrams. Great Abrams is presenting me with, uh, let me see what it says on the back. The Army Commendation Medal, which was later revoked when General Clark insists that it should be a Legion of Merit, which is a much higher decoration than that. And so they took that away from me. But Great Abrams was all. Yeah, that's me coming out of the water. That's, I pre pretended I was invading Here's France again. Point. Here's the black and white. Well, depending. We get that? Yeah, we. Need, I mean, to really get like the. He's hoping we get that monument built on. I hope you do he too. Beach. I think you will. <coughs> For two memorial that's going up on the mall in Washington. What? Um, yeah, it's. Um, I think it's. Uh, I think you'll get it done. I think it's going to happen. Because yeah. I would like, um, do, you have, do you have back issues with stuff that you okay. have gotten, that you've done in the past?